In today's episode, I talk with Dr. Ravi Gornell. She's a functional and integrative GP that uses ancestral principles in the treatment of her patients. We talk about a range of uh, foundations around ancestral health, including environmental toxins, sleep, stress, nutrition, exercise. We cover quite a lot as these are all associated with her new foundations program. So a lot of good, valuable insights in this episode. I hope you guys enjoy it. Before we jump in, this podcast is brought to you by Vital Origin, Australia's best and most ethical animal-based company, helping you reintroduce nature's original superfoods back into your diet. All of our listeners, you can get 10% off by using the discount code SOURCE10 at checkout. Out. And of course, if you want to support the channel and you like the content that we're doing, please help us out by liking and subscribing or sharing it with your friends and family. All right, on to our show with Dr. Ravi Gornell. Ravi, thank you so much for joining us on our podcast here. I'm really excited to have a chat with you today. Thanks for having me. No problem. So it's always good to start off with a little bit of your background. I think it's nice for the listeners to get to know you a little bit. So why don't you share a little bit of your background, how you got into the ancestral health space and how you apply that in medicine. And then obviously we can talk about your new program that you have coming up with your foundations program. Sounds good. Um, so I am originally from the UK. I was born and brought up there and did my uni and everything over there. Um, I worked for about a year as a doctor and then moved over to Australia in about 2009 um for a year <laughs> i'm still here um and that, that was um yeah a long time ago junior doctor kind of went down a, a surgical path and and did surgery for a year few years and you know met my now husband and decided we wanted to settle down and did gp um and then subsequently had three children very quickly actually um i'd say i had three kids within three years and two months called insanity but love them they're great wow. yeah, uh, my oldest very is just quick turned, yes it was oldest is just turned 10 um and it's quite interesting so i'm indian background my mum and dad are both from india um and my obstetrician also used, always used to say to me you're gonna you know you're high risk for gestational diabetes just purely from my ethnicity mm. Um, and look, I got away with it. Nothing in the, in, in the first pregnancy, second was fine. But by the time my third one came along, I um, was diagnosed with GDM, gestational diabetes, um, around the 26th week of pregnancy, whenever we do that test. Um, so, damn it, he was right. Um, I was never... Um, <laughs> At least you got through the two. Yes, exactly. Yep, yep. Um, I was never any, I'd say, different to what I am in terms of I was never overweight. I, you know, it was always healthy. I gained no more than about 10 kilos in pregnancy. So it was all kind of very um, fine. But when I got that diagnosis, I started to actually track my blood sugars and look at my diet really closely. Mm. Um, now, I was brought up on a very clean, almost Indian vegetarian type diet. My mum's vegetarian. So but she was very big on everything was made from scratch. And we were brought up on a shoestring shoe budget. So, you know, everything was was very, very simple and plain. Um, mm. So I was never really someone who ate badly. It was a, it would have been more of a plant based diet. I never avoided um, meats as I as I got older, but it was that kind of diet. But so I actually started looking at my blood sugars and I couldn't believe what things like lentils would do to my blood sugar, for example, or, or things like that. So I modified my, my diet just in that time during that pregnancy to, to monitor blood sugar. So I learned a lot about how that was impact, what I was eating was impacting me. Um, and I ended up, like I said, I was never overweight, but I lost about two kilos and I was 26 weeks pregnant, still eating well, um, and never gained an ounce <laughs> after that since uh, until, until uh, my last, yeah, till my son was born. Um, and he was fine. He was a normal size. Everything was well controlled. So I learned a lot then actually, um, about the impact of, of diet on, on, on how I felt too. I felt pretty good like that. You know, the recovery was great. I felt great. I wasn't by any means, if I look back at it now, I wasn't keto. I was lower in yeah, carb. I was going to ask, were you, you know, sort of in yeah, that low no, carb no. keto space? Not, not in pregnancy. And I wouldn't normally advise someone that isn't that way to do that in pregnancy. I just lowered them enough yeah. um, to, to be able to monitor my, my blood sugars and keep myself um, stable. So, so, so no, I actually, if I look back on it now, um, no, it probably wasn't anywhere near as low carb as I have gone at times. Um, so then, you know, fast forward, um, you know, you want to get a bit fit, you, you, you know, my last baby was 
to, you know, one or two. And I was like, okay, I want to, you know, start getting healthy. I looked at uh, Red Jason Fung's Obesity Code, which I think is a bit of a turning point for a lot of people. It's a great book. Um, yeah. And got into fasting, low carb and um, all of that space and felt phenomenal and, 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 you know, lost any baby weight I had and, and felt great. And then started great. to say, well, one second, if this is working for me, why don't I recommend a few of these things to um, my, some of my patients? Um, and um, started looking a lot more in the space, would just recommend it to some of my really well-known patients. Say, why don't we try and, you know, cut out the bread or, or you know, just increase your, your protein or, or things like that. And, and the results were great. Like I just could see that actually, you know, um, some people would do really, really well. Meanwhile, so it was working kind of well. Uh, I'd got my space. I started to gradually find that I wasn't feeling as good as I had initially, and my health started to go a little bit downhill um, the subsequent year or two after that. I think I, you know, I'd argue that I'd, I hit maybe the, everything a bit too hard because you felt so good. I did a couch to 5K, you know, you all started CrossFit, like everything. <laughs> yeah, just do everything. Like, <laughs> everything I do a little bit. Yeah. You know, forget the fact that you got three small children, full job, you know. Anyway, so I, I, I pushed. Yeah, well done. Stress. Yes, exactly. I think I used that hormesis as a, 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 I think I just pushed it too far. Um, yeah. and I found that I wasn't feeling very well looking for answers, wasn't getting any answers to look, I'm eating so well. I've even gone as far as carnivore, like, you know, because if zero low carb is good, zero must be better. Like, you know, and, and autoimmune look at a bit of, of psoriasis and, and look, my psoriasis would disappear if I went carnivore. So I knew that there was some good stuff happening. Um, but it wasn't, mm -hmm. I wasn't feeling great. Like I, my energy was lagging. Um, I was gaining weight now. So lots of, but, you know, things went right. My cycles went off and lots of warning signs. Um, let's just say I've learned the hard way. Um, and, and, and then I actually, <laughs> I know, and then I thought, well, look, looking for answers, you know, if, if you go down one rabbit hole, you go down another. I found um, Chris Kreser's stuff quite interesting. So I did his in adapt functional medicine training. Um, and I did that program and it was brilliant. Um, at the same time, I also, it's great was course. Getting to, yeah, it was really good course. Um, he's fantastic. It's, you know, it's all, I love the fact that it's all very, you know, he's got literature for everything. It's, you know, very backed up and it was great. So I learned a lot that way. And, and, and then look, discovered I had a bit of, um, mold toxicity. I was obviously working in a moldy building and lots of other rabbit holes to go down and actually, you know, maybe losing body fat that quickly. Um, can actually mobilize a lot of toxins and can actually make you sick. So I, I learned a lot through that journey. Um, and also practicing wise, I also work, worked out that I couldn't do 10 minute medicine. Um, I couldn't convince somebody that their diet or their lifestyle could be impacting how they felt um, in 10 minutes. Yeah. Your job as a doctor is number one, make sure there's nothing serious going on. That's, that's always at the forefront of our um, minds, sorry, um, of our heads. So we try and do that first. And then, and then that's, I guess, step one. And if that doesn't, um, if that doesn't work, then, or if you say, well, look, okay, there's, I can't find an excuse for why you're feeling the way that you're feeling, um, that there could be another cause for your symptoms or things like that. So you don't, you, you exclude serious things and you go down, okay, well, a lot of the complaints people will come to would be either abdominal pain, fatigue, headaches, you know, things that actually, once you can say there's nothing serious, you can say, well, let's work on your lifestyle couldn't do that in 10 minutes. So I started to actually work towards doing longer consults, one hour for everybody, um, changed my practice from being in a conventional GP to a food first um, based practice in locally um, and, and, and have kind of evolved from then to, I've gone down, nutrition is everything, fasting will, will help everything to functional medicine <laughs> where you <laughs> test, test, test and actually go down that. And then you're like, well, now I've got, instead of Yep. medications to prescribe you i've got a whole list of supplements that are you know it, it, it kind of didn't fit well again with me and i think where i've fallen yeah, almost now, just replacing one with the other that's what it felt like and and as much as i love kreza's work it, there was a lot of there's a protocol for this and you've got to test this and there's two thousand dollars worth of functional testing first and and i i feel like everything in that space has a place but you can't cookie cutter the approach to everybody. And I kind of have now fallen in a place where I've now spun off and started my own um, practice on my, just, just me. Um, and I do longer consults. I really want to get to know what that person, where that person is in their journey. 
um, and I start with the absolute basics of um, what I call the foundations, um, and then we'll build upon that with, um, you know, do the, are they responding? How are they going? See them, you know, within a couple of months of making the change. And that's when you might then think, actually, there's a bit more going on. We might do some additional testing or looking a bit deeper under the hood to see what's, you know, you're not doing as well as I thought you would on, on with this approach. We need to go a bit deeper. Um, so that's kind of where I am. Yeah, I love that approach. I am now. Yeah, so that's, it seems to be. Yeah, and we've, we've talked yeah. before, and I think we have a very similar approach to that where, yeah, there's definitely, I think a lot of people go through that journey, especially getting into functional medicine where testing becomes everything and protocols are everything. And then I guess over time you realize that for the vast majority of people, just focusing on some of the basics and the foundations for most, it's going to move the needle quite significantly without the need of all the testing and all the other things that can, can raise the price quite a bit. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so yeah, yeah. and that, that's kind of where we're at, at the moment. And I, I was working quite, I really want to work with more health coaches. I think that's where, where I, I feel like it, the world out there is tricky to navigate. It really is. And, yeah. and it's a fine line between feeling like everything's out there to kill you um and everything's fine <laughs> right like so it, 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 it's I, yeah. you know it's 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 tricky to to go out there and and live quote unquote healthy ancestral type lifestyle in a, in a modern world and and that's really i don't we can't go and hide um and, and go and live in the jungle or, or, or get back to being you know completely in nature again we do need to find a way to 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 survive in our current environment and that's where I really try to work Absolutely. and say, okay, we've got what's what are the important steps? What are the steps that you can say this is okay? It's not the end of the world if you know you eat this way or or, or live in this space or, or whatever. And and actually, that's where I say sometimes supplementation does help because we are still living in in in, in our modern environment, and we do need to find ways yeah. to to support that. So yeah, it's a bit of a hybrid, really. Yeah, and I think. That's, that's what's nice about the evolutionary lens. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions around ancestral health, paleo, evolutionary medicine, whatever you want to use as the terminology where people think what we're saying is we need to go back to being hunter gatherers, living in caves and being hundred percent in nature, which as you said, is very unrealistic for most of us. Like we, there are a lot of benefits and niceties of living in modern society between medicine, technology, all those types of things where we can be more comfortable. But I think the, the evolutionary lens gives us the framework to look at, all right, what are we, what is our biology used to and what are we supposed to be exposed to and how is that influencing disease? And then how do we leverage that in the modern day to help people regain their health and vitality? It, it doesn't mean that we negate and throw out everything of modernity. It's just that how can we apply things? And, and again, that's where things like what are in your foundation program around ancestral health, whether it's getting outside, you know, movement, food, there's a lot of concepts and things that we can take from that ancestral model and apply it in the modern day. And then yeah, inevitably, we often see that people end up with much better health if we try to align with what biology is really supposed to be getting. No, 100%. So it was from that that we, um, um, my health coach and I, um, put together what we call the foundations program. And it just started. So where we are now, is a, is a, it's a, attached to a gym. And they do a six-week challenge um, for people. And we thought, well, could we do our own where we kind of make it a bit more of a personalized approach um, and we ran our first one last year and it was it was about 10 people in the first one and it's and we don't we wouldn't we wouldn't be more than 10 15 people is what we'd normally get in in this kind of group so it starts with I caught up with everybody for about half an hour um, we organized some blood work so that's some that's testing that I do look at like I do look at blood work just to get a bit of an idea of their metabolic markers um, some nutritional markers just some some signs that there might be support needed in in there and also looking for forward and we haven't probably mentioned it yet is preventative medicine i mean that's you know to me that's Absolutely. something i'm really passionate about starting from way earlier but prevention you know that prevention's better than cure look it's 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 foundational yeah. so that's really when i look at that I, I i will look at blood work and say look these are little warning signs they're just little little things so it's blood work we then um did a six-week program where we would kind of catch up with everybody weekly um and go through educating and helping support them through a diet change. Now I use the paleo diet as a very basic elimination type 
or a reset is probably the, the word that we use. I use it as a reset and I get people to do it for about 30 days and then reintroduce. So I don't, uh, when it comes to nutrition, I've changed my stance a few times in terms of um, how strictly you go. It really it is personalized. Um, there's some people that I think yeah. a, a short term carnival diet is fantastic for. And there's some people where I think actually, you know, you probably are, you know, can, can expand a, from that quite a bit. Um, but I also am very big on saying, where do you live and where is your health at? Yeah. If you are actually just trying to prevent and be healthy, what grows around you? What grows within your vicinity? Is there a local farmer's market we can go to? You know, what, 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 where can you source your food from within that area of where you live? And in which case, for my children to be here in Queensland and not have a mango in summer doesn't make sense because it's got a bit of sugar yeah. in it. So, so there's, there's, there's vice versa. But then I do, <laughs> but I do like to keep animal nutrition at the foundation because that's something where I do feel they're going to at least get the protein, the, the base, you know, the, most of the micronutrients. Um, and using animal-based nutrition is, my, is I guess, the, the, the pillar of it all. And then from that, you can actually move it around depending on the person. I mean, if they've got really brittle diabetes, then no, the mango is probably not ideal. Um, so working on that and seeing people where they're at in their health journey is, is important. So we talk a lot about nutrition and not just about the do's and don'ts of what you can and can't eat, but you know, how do you eat and, 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 and what's the amount of protein that you're getting and making sure that you are actually making sure that you get protein to your plate first and then we, 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 we move around from that. So that's one part that we work on. Um, and then I'd love to, before yeah, we, before we go a yeah. bit deeper into that, I'd, I'd love to mm -hmm. just pick your brain a little bit about um, what testing that you do to come back to that at the beginning. Cause um, you know, not everyone is necessarily getting testing done with their doctor. And again, from that preventative based approach, I think I personally recommend everyone at least do that annually with yep. either their GP or whatever uh, practitioner they're working with. So are there any particular things you're looking for in that blood work? Um, other, you know, tests that maybe aren't ordered on a, a normal panel, say something like a, an ApoB, are there any special things that you're looking at or, or what are you looking at specifically for people to know? So at the very basic, I will do obviously things like cholesterol, blood sugar, kidney function, liver function, all of, all of the standards, which every GP out there is, is, is looking at from a, from that perspective. Um, but I, time, I also put with that things like a fasting insulin, which isn't, isn't done widely. Um, right. And I feel like that gives me a lot of information, you know, off the bat as to, to where they're at from from the starting point. Um, I will look at um, I do. A, so I do a hybrid. I do um, some standard testing and I do some private testing, too. So I do a deeper look at thyroid and I do that privately just because I like to look at the individual thyroid numbers, the T4, T3, reverse T3. So I get a bit of an idea of what's going on there. So a, a deeper look at thyroid. I like to look at leptin. I'm a big fan of looking at your fasting mm. leptin. Um, there's a few people that I probably and wouldn't for bother those, with. Yeah. For those that aren't familiar with leptin, because it's probably not as as well known, could you give a, a little crash course on, on Le leptin and why that's important for people? Leptin's a hormone released by your body fat. I'm going to simplify this. Released by your body fat, it communicates with your brain. Its job is to make you feel full. So it's kind of from an evolutionary perspective, I'd say um, your, your leptin would be, okay, this is my body fat stores. This is how hard I would have to be hunting or looking for food the next day, I guess. Um, it's also a very, I, I kind of use it as a surrogate marker for someone's circadian um, biology because it does, it, it is a circadian hormone. Um, and actually yep. leptin resistance will lead to a very high leptin in the morning. And some people can actually get very low leptin um, in the mornings too. So when your leptin's out of whack, I'm looking more at focusing highly on your circadian biology and your circadian rhythms. Um, cortisol is another one, but cortisol is yeah, tricky. Cortisol's got a range, so it doesn't, and, 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 and it, it's, 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 it needs more than just one testing and cortisol is quite complicated to, to, to get the same information from and we can't easily check melatonin. So mm. that it's just kind of my proxy marker for that. The other population that I really look at leptin for is people that can't lose weight or are struggling with their weight. Um, it's a big, big yeah. piece of the puzzle. And that's where when I got down the low carb, because I started um, when I was first practicing, I was recommending a low carb diet to everybody. And it was great. But then I've got people that also found me come to, to find me that have been doing low carb for 10 odd years. They've still got fatty liver and they've still, you know, and, and I'm not in the camp of they must not be doing it hard enough or their carbs must not be low enough or whatever. I feel like that's really just yeah. such an un <laughs> uh, so unfair. Um, and I think having yeah, gone through not very it myself. 
no, it's not. And having gone through it myself where I'm not well, but I'm carnivore, I'm not, I could not carnivore any harder. Like, do you know what I mean? So I, I kind of learned that, <laughs> yeah. it's, um, that there's, there's so much more to it. And my own leptin was, was, was really high. And, you know, so it's, it's, I look at that from that perspective. Um, so more so with people with weight issues is where I would go on that. Um, but if there are other signs, they're waking up and they feel they don't feel hungry, they don't want to eat breakfast, they're full, and some people feel, you know, nauseous at the thought of eating in the morning, and then come in yeah. the afternoon, they are unsatiated. They can have a whole meal and still feel like they haven't hasn't quite hit the spot. They're still looking for something. Um, there are other little signs. So you can make a clinical diagnosis too. I just think with blood work, it's it's always nice when you're putting in so much effort to your diet and lifestyle um, to be able to track and say, this is moving in the right direction. This is looking better. Um, I know as a patient and a clinician that seeing, seeing progress on paper is really rewarding and really encouraging. Um, And, and I'm not asking people to do easy things. So I see it in that way as a bit of a, encouragement it's a behavior reward, modification uh, tool. yeah exactly and and but also as a as a gp i, I don't want to uh, you know i don't want people to get sick right i don't want them to be you know further down so if we can prevent things and get blood sugar well controlled and, and get their get their cholesterol you know in, in the right balance and make sure that they don't have fatty liver like all those things are quite helpful um, at looking at so other blood tests could be for, for you know a lot of females hormones can be a problem I like to look at testosterone mm. sex hormone binding globulin gives me a big idea of, of any kind of um, issues with estrogen dominance or, or, or things like that um, toxicities so so they're the kind of things that I will look at um, inflammatory markers are helpful um, but it's mm. not and, and there's some nutritional markers but what I say to people it's not the absolute number that I'm looking for I'm looking for patterns so I put the blood work together yeah. and say, what does this overall picture tell me about um, your, your, your physiology? Not, not this number is not in the right range. It's no, how does that relate to yeah. that and relate not to that? Not treating a number. No, no, not at all. Um, and, and looking at patterns, I look for patterns. So it kind of all comes together as opposed to looking at individual markers on their own. Um, but yeah, and, yeah. and then, yeah. And it sounds like again, a good level then, of yeah. personalization. Yeah, exactly. And that way, sometimes, you know, if, if there is a big deficiency, you might not be converting T4 to T3 very well or or, or things like that. And, and actually, I've seen beautiful things happen with just um, getting people um, nutritionally up to, de- you know, with diet or with temporary supplementation. But I've seen um, mm. really, really lovely things um, and, and, it, and it translates clinically as well. So some of the testing will depend yeah, on fantastic. people's symptoms, too of course. So yeah. like a lot of it is they might need additional markers because they might have, you know, muscle issues or, or histamine issues or, or, or things like that. So then I might of target course. it. Yeah. According to that. So not everybody gets the yeah. same stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it gives a good framework, at least for people to understand some of the you know, baseline testing and things that you're looking at. And I think you've outlined the importance of personalization, which as you said, there's no cookie cutter approach. I mean, there can be, but it often won't get the same results. So I think it's no. important that you have a, even within a program and people you work with that you've got a level of personalization, which is fantastic. Yeah, no, it's good. It is good. And, and yeah, I, that's what I found. You, you learn a lot from your patients. Um, yeah, and, and, I can imagine. And, and, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and just seeing different people respond in different ways. It's, it's beautiful and, and it's challenging. Um, and at times frustrating for, for the patients and myself to say, well, oh, they're, they're doing so much and they haven't, you know, what are we missing? Um, and, and that's where, you know, once again, I've got colleagues that I can call upon and, and things like that to, to say, okay, look, this person needs a bit more of a personalized approach in this area. So I act also as a bit of a coordinator, I guess, to say, um, Great. this is where, you know, I, and I didn't mention I'm doing um, a master's at the moment in integrative medicine. Um, and it's been really actually quite eye-opening and helped. So we've got functional medicine, integrative medicine. They use interchangeably um, the terms, but they are often, a bit, they, yeah. They, yeah, they often are, but they're quite different. Um, and I think I'm probably moving more towards integrative. I want to work with other other people that I think mm. different. Yeah, I think that collaborative have, approach is so important. Oh, it's so good. Um, you can't do it all. Um, and and other people's experience and um, you know uh, and, and assessments are so valuable um, to see how they can help 
you know, that person get better. So like I say, like the health coach can help with the behavioral side and, you know, working on someone that can do manual support and, and, and yeah, so many different modalities that you can bring together. Um, so my aim is to eventually get to a place where we can do that under one roof and different practitioners can start to actually, you know, get together and talk about their patients and actually say, well, how can we best help them? And what do we think is going on? And, Great. Um, and yeah, and, and offer them that, that better support would be ideal. Yeah, I think that ultimately leads to the best results for patients when you have a whole sort of multidisciplinary team, you have lots of different experience and expertise that ultimately gets the best results for people. Yeah, no, definitely. No, it's good. It's quite eye opening. Yeah, and, and you learn stuff as well as a clinician. Like, I mean, I'm learning, you know, yep. everyone's got something that they great. know. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah. Well, coming back to nutrition then, so we started um, dialing into a couple of things. So you mentioned that animal food sort of formed the basis of that. And, you know, people that have tuned into uh, our podcast here are probably very familiar with the importance of that. Um, could you maybe outline from your perspective why an animal-based um, source of food as a foundation is, is really important? You know, you mentioned protein and, and some micronutrients, but maybe giving the audience just a, a few tidbits of, of why that's really foundational, because again, the, the mainstream narrative at the moment is very anti-meat. And a lot of people have, I guess, the idea that meat is bad, meat causes cancer and heart disease and a whole host of things. So um, yeah, there's a bit of a, a discrepancy and a discordance there in, in, I guess, the view towards meat. So I'd love to hear your opinions there. Look, I look at it in, 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 in a few ways. I mean, there's a lot of nutrition research out there and you can Google what is in some spinach and what it's in um, some some beef and, and you can kind of get the breakdown quite easily um, and the way I say it to my to my patients is it's nutrient density is what we're looking for so what's got the most nutrition in it but that it, a lot of places it just stops there but what are you actually going to get from it and what is your digestive mm. system designed to actually absorb so looking at the absorption and then obviously what's going to stop you from absorbing things and and, and, you know, where's your stomach acid at? So I do a lot of support for digestion too. I mean, there's a lot of people that have got meat aversion because they can't digest it or they've come from a diet that was heavy in, in legumes, grains and, and things. And, and now, you know, they don't have the ability to break things down as well. You can see it in children. They just put, if, if a child is pushing away and not wanting to eat, going off red meat, they're, they're not digesting it well, usually as well. So it's not just a, a, a taste yeah, thing, which is where we kind of stop at. Yeah, we've seen it a lot. Um, so I... I look at nutrition as what's in it and what you're going to get from it. Um, and, and to me, what I've seen clinically and personally, um, animal nutrition just wins hands down. It, there's nothing, I, you know, you can't satiate that that easily with anything else. And, and I've seen such brilliant um, res, you know, results with everybody um, from that. And, and look, this yeah. is coming from a place of being brought up as like an Indian vegetarian. Um, I barely ate any red meat because the only red meat in the home my dad had made and it was too spicy. So I couldn't eat, I didn't barely <laughs> eat it. So um, I have, you know, gone for, you know, and my digestive system's had to adapt. Um, but, yeah. you know, little things that I noticed, like my nails have, have never, ever been so hard. And, you know, so, so you see signs that I look for and, and this is the feedback I get from a lot of my patients and I get you know I can get from people from all walks of life that have come from veganism to to they're already carnivore and I'm trying to get them to eat an apple like you know so I can get like a, a, a big range <laughs> um of 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 people um but yeah I, I just find from that perspective um and like I said even without supplementation and look I'm not just saying this because this is your podcast but like the organ meats it's it's a is a big game changer as well and, and trying to bring that in um, you know, I wish I knew more about it when my babies were smaller. Um, but yeah. you know, trying to sneak that in and, and, and having easier ways of doing it are great. And, and that kind of is, I mean, that's, they're the kind of things that I say are oh, your, your nature's multivitamins really. Um, Absolutely. that's going to help you. Yeah. yeah preaching help, help preaching you know. to the choir is definitely yeah, what, what exactly. we believe and why we bring that product to market. And yeah. it, it's yeah. one of those things that so much of the population just doesn't consume anymore. And from a nutrient density perspective, like you were saying that they're sort of the most nutrient dense, but they're yeah. not necessarily nowadays the most palatable, palatable. for people or, or the easiest <laughs> to cook. So yeah, yeah, it's much, much easier to get them in a capsule form. But yeah, and we've talked plenty about, you know, the specific nutrients that are only available from animal sources, whether B12, heme yeah. iron, those yeah. types of things. So yeah, yeah, there's a range of nutrients that are very important. And, and same with the protein side, like the, 
yeah. range of full essential amino acids in animal-based sources versus plant-based is a big difference in relation to bioavailability. So I think yeah, it's definitely. definitely important that people prioritize those things in their diet. And yeah, you can still have some varied approach with other things in there, but I would definitely agree that it's sort of a foundational component to keep in there. Yeah, definitely. And then the other side of me saying eating locally, I mean, you know, animal within your region that's grown up in your environment, that's been reared properly. Um, there's just something so um, important, I think, about that as well. Just And, and mm. if I can get the message out to people to support the right type of farming, which is so important, so, so important, um, you know, and there's some beautiful, beautiful practices out there. We're so lucky here in Australia, I think, yeah. um, from that perspective. Very lucky. That, that's, yeah, that, that to me, from an, on an ethical standpoint, is really important. Um, to promote yeah. eating that yeah way. and the more local you can be the better you mm. know if you're getting from the local butcher that gets it from the farm yeah. Yeah. that's not too far away then yeah mm. i think that's such a sustainable and ethical manner of doing yeah. it and of course the way that the animals are raised is important too and that yeah. can be a whole whole separate podcast yes i know itself, exactly but, yep, yep, yep. Uh, I'd love to go through some of the other items because yeah, your, your program is quite holistic. So I'd love to sort of walk through the other aspects because, and we were talking about this offline, I think in the ancestral mm. health space, a lot of people do focus very heavy on nutrition and mm -hmm. yes, that's an important component, but you still need to consider all the other aspects, like we were saying earlier, sleep, stress, some of the other foundations. And so I'd love to yeah, go through some of those and see how you address some of those other areas and you can pick whichever one you want to jump into next. Oh. Sleep, I think, I, I, honestly, if I had to say what's more important, your sleep or your food, <laughs> I, just, I could kind of, you know, it's hard to, to pick it, really. Um, I, I, I've learned mm. this once again. I've been a night owl probably my whole life. I was the, 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 the student that was studying at night when mum went to bed. And when she woke up in the morning, I was still there at my computer. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> it, it, you know, just to get through you know, the, 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 the love, lovely uh, studies at our med school. But um, so I've, I, I know firsthand um, how much better I feel when I've had good quality sleep. So it's not just um, that, you know, closing your eyes and getting some sleep. So when I talk about sleep with patients, I talk a lot about the circadian biology and I talk a lot about our natural rhythms. Now, from a circadian biology perspective, I'm not just saying that it only helps sleep. There are numerous processes within the body um, that are on a circadian clock. So the benefits of having good sleep from a circadian perspective are go way beyond just the rest and restoration that you get from sleeping alone. Your hormone balancing, your digestion, your, you know, the, the list will go on and on and on. Um, so I'm very big on using our environment, using sun, using your light environment um, to help, um, to help, I guess, um, to help set your circadian rhythm. So if you think about it, I've, I've got to, I obviously go back to the UK fairly often. Um, it doesn't take long, you know, when I get there two or three nights and I'm on their biological clock, I'm on, 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 their, on their light rhythm. And, and when I'm, I'm back here, it takes a bit longer sometimes, but it's, you know, same thing. Um, you can adjust yourself <laughs> to a different time zone pretty easily like it's not it's, it's not hard to, to do that so that's why I often tell patients is if you can get over jet lag we can change your current circadian rhythm with ease it's a great um, analogy yeah so it's it, it we use it a lot and and, 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 it, and that's what I see with a lot of people they're like it just takes a few days and they don't need their alarm anymore and they're waking up so one of the biggest things I start with is morning sunlight um and ideally I like to, them to get out within within half an hour of sunrise um if they can be up for sunrise that's a bonus it depends on the time of year and how compliant the patient is but that you know this is one yep. thing i've had the feedback i've had time and time and time again is how much better they feel and i know this myself um if i've you know either been unwell or, or, or whatever and missed a few mornings i don't feel as good so coming from an Same. absolute night owl to seeing sunrise was is, is you know it's a big shift um but it is so 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 good um so i do a lot of that yeah, i think um, a lot of people still still don't value that that much yet i think the education still growing in that space mm. I, I feel uh, i guess people don't necessarily associate their overall health with their light exposure but i would see the same it's such a big shift when people do start aligning their circadian rhythm properly 
yeah, it's it's huge, and 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 mm. the benefits are, are just beautiful. They're so good. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll start with the, with making sure they get morning sun, um, and then the other thing that's quite big, um, which is a shift from how I was was living once again, is that fasting. A lot of people do the sixteen and eight, or the you know one or two meals a day, mm. and and because they're inherently leptin resistant, it's easy to skip breakfast because you know it's also yep. the least social meal of the day. Everybody wants to sit with their families at dinner and 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 socialize and be with them, which I completely once again think is, is so important. Um, but getting that, you know, that mindset that actually see the sunrise and then eventually work yourself up to a really nice big breakfast. And it, you know, you get extra brownie points if you sit out on the deck and eat it in the sunshine. And actually, you know, Perfect. And make that make that a time <laughs> where I sit with my kids now and we all have a really big cooked breakfast. I couldn't have eaten, you know, um, anything in the past. Like you'd feel too, too, too nauseous in the morning. But um, trying to get that routine of see the sunrise, maybe it's a really good time for a nice little walk or a little meditation or something or, or, or something like that. And then, um, and actually then kind of work up to, um, to, to having a nice big breakfast. Start slow. So there's some people that have that you know really can't. Um, eat anything because they say look I just feel too sick eating in the morning um but then you know could be one single boiled egg or something and, and build it in so big breakfast nice sunrise in the morning Start small. that's exactly it start with something um and eventually actually this is what a, a lot of the feedback I get from a lot of people is like I'm hungry in the mornings now I never used to be I'm actually hungry um yep. and I've seen people go from skipping breakfast and fasting to bringing in fasting eating a bit more and losing weight it's you just can't unsee it once you see it it's 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 crazy. Yeah. So the, the hormonal shift. A lot of people real. don't. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that the, your appetite is somewhat programmed, right? Like a lot of it is just neural regulation, and so you get used to. If you consistently don't have breakfast, then you won't feel hungry. But it doesn't take long to reprogram that, and so I think a lot of people don't realize that. And if you just start slow, like you were saying, and adding more food in the morning, eventually that will shift, and it will feel fine that will be normal and you actually be hungry in the morning but just take the the process and a little bit of um i guess motivation in starting that and then it just sort of takes care of itself yeah definitely and and then look in an ideal world you get as much sun exposure in the day as you can and that doesn't have to mean go out and burn yourself you could actually you could be under a shade but actually just take your don't wear your sunnies and make sure that you're you're the way I say is your body knows what time of day it is through your eyes. Um, and, and unless your eyes are actually outside, it doesn't know where you are, what's going on, what time of day it is. So always be like, it could be little five minute, call them smokos, sun, sun smokos, um, go out and take a five minute break, you know, open the window or, or something. Just tell your body it's 10 o'clock. It's 11 it's o'clock. Daytime. It's 12 o'clock. That's it. Keep giving you a yeah. little signal if you can. And, and it doesn't have to be a big shift in your day. It could just be, okay, rather than, you know, spending my, I've got a phone call to make, rather than sitting in the office, I might walk outside and do it. Or, you know, just little, if you're mindful of it, you can kind of bring it into your into your day as much as possible. And then the other one, which I think is one of the harder things, is blocking the blue light at night um, and actually blocking yeah. that, 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 you know, all our LEDs, our screens, our, and once again, we've got tools. My computer goes red. I wear red glasses. I switch off the LEDs. We use salt lamps. Like, you know, there's, there's ways around it. There's, there's loads of beautiful companies now that sell special lamps and things. So just being mindful of that side of things um, is, is, I think, really, really quite profound as well. And actually, before I'd done any of the sunrise, all I started doing was wearing my – I did a, a, a Dutch test on myself – few years ago um and my melatonin was just non-existent i was like oh gosh this isn't good um and um all Not i did was wear, oh no it wasn't good all i did was wear my and, and now thinking back to it we were in the brightest led house it was just ridiculously bright lights um all i did was wear my red glasses and i i've been a serial sleep tracker i use my aura now but i used to use a fitbit and my deep sleep went from maybe 20 minutes a night to an hour and a half like that was the only Amazing. change I made. And it was actually, that was when That's I was great. like, okay, there's something that's, in this. Mm. 
it's pretty straightforward too. It's it's not mm. very expensive. It doesn't require a lot of modification to your home or buying a whole yeah. bunch of different bulbs and lamps. So it's nice to know yeah, exactly. that there's a relatively it's straightforward a method for people. Yeah, and I'll put some yeah. links too to a couple companies for those who are yeah. listening or interested in some of the blue blockers. There's there's yeah. a range of different ones. They they have ones that are more for for daytime or for computer use, which don't block out as much. And then they have ones yeah. that progressively get more and more, where you can have the full red ones, where it pretty Sorry, much blocks out yeah. almost all blue light yeah and i've got those as you well so if if i happen to yeah go out and i'm exposed to light it was interesting because yeah. talking to max Hain, which we were talking about you know he he's obviously big in this space now and i recommend mm. people listen to that episode but he was mm. also talking about even now photoreceptors in the skin and in the yeah. blood vessels and things and how there can be you know ongoing effects so even if we're blocking the blue light um, yeah. via our eyes which is going to be the most profound um due to the the network to to the brain but yeah it seems maybe there may be some aspects even for skin exposure and 100%. that applies both to getting natural light exposure and artificial light so it's a it's a really interesting area now and you can definitely go down into uh, the that's, weeds in it but that's exactly it right and where i sit at the moment is i'm just wanting people to do the absolute foundations the basics the what stuff that is easily implemented yeah. Don't worry about your skin receptor at the moment if you're still sitting watching telly with no protection at all. So, you know, start in yeah. one place. And how do you feel? Where's your health at? What are your markers looking like? And 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 if you are if you found a happy balance between living in this world and feeling good, then that's great. And and you know and and we don't see any signs of chronic disease developing or anything like that. Then that's really kind of the balance but there are, yeah there are people that have to go a bit further um i think i fell into that category um to, to get to, to get you know to get to optimal um to feeling good there is there is that there is that um side to things yeah. but no max's work is great yeah. it's um really good that yeah he's it's, it all it's out there. yeah i mean with jack cruz and everything that they're doing mm. in that area i think they're really yeah shining a light pun not mm. intended there on mm. on the importance <laughs> of some of that stuff so yeah i'm yeah. definitely interested to follow it and see more and more in that space and it will become i guess or has become more of a concern just because like you're saying all the artificial light that is in our environment now and of course you know we're always stuck to screens and things now just due to the nature of work and how we live in the modern day yeah, I think honestly the biggest it here is with the children and having three small kids mm. myself um, and trying to, you know, they all had the little red reading clips. Oh, mama, I can't see the colours. <laughs> I was like, oh gosh, what do I, where do I go with this? <laughs> so now they've got little salt lamps and, you know, it's, but they know there's no, yeah. no you know, they, they're not allowed any screens after um, a certain time and, um, and, and, you know, and, and yeah, it, they'll just be, they'll just get used to the fact that mum's one of those annoying mums that does that. So, um, yeah. That yeah, they'll thank you in the long run. That's exactly it. Yeah, I, I hope. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's where I think the most, that's it. That's the, they're the most vulnerable, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, especially now because it's exposure from such a young age now. Even mm. my generation, you know, I didn't grow up with laptops and mobile phones. We just didn't have those. And even the ones we did, when they eventually came around, the screens were not like they are now. So no, yeah, it'll it's be interesting really to see how the younger generations go. It's really, really hard. I know my, my 10 year old just did her um, nap plan and it was her writing exam is typed. I was a bit shocked. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> so they even say now handwriting and things type. for kids. Oh, it's just not yeah. necessary. Anyway, it's, that's a whole other yeah, topic again. Different, different era, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. There's so, the, I've been following um, recently Jonathan Haid, he, he wrote a book, which I won't go into too much detail, but he's looking at the rise of anxiety and depression now due to mm. social media, which that's that's a, another very interesting area. I know. That's one thing that, yeah. And, and you hear all the, you know, the, the, the parents in the tech world, how they don't want their kids on it till they're, you know, 15 plus. Yeah, which is very telling. It is very telling. I know, I know. My kids are not going to love me in their teens, yeah. but anyway, we'll wait, we'll wait, we'll cross that bridge when it comes to it. <laughs> Yeah, um, in a couple of years at least. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, look, that's that's sleep, and then obviously you know, uh, simple sleep hygiene, winding down, um, other things that you know, warmth in the evening can be helpful. Cold, cold exposure in the mornings, those kinds of things um, can come into that. But um, really, just and then optimizing your actual sleep environment. Um, you know, are they someone with lots of allergies? What's their bedding like? What's their what's their environment there like? You know. Um, going really deep into and this is what i've been working a lot with um a local um chiropractor who probably is 
works more on that functional neurological aspect of things. And he talks about our airways and how actual um, anything that's compromising airway function, so mouth breathing because you've got you know nasal obstruction or anything like that, can have a, a significant impact um, on on your life. Um, and I see I see in this um, another thing. If some once again weight loss resistance, how are you sleeping? Like the amount of people that are not sleeping well, whether they know it or not, um, are they obstructing? So I'll do a sleep study or, or something like that just to see what's going on with your oxygen. So sleep, there's that side of it too. Um, are you oxygenating your brain when you're meant to be at night? And is there something going on that is that that is and will hold you back from getting your optimal um, health outcome? Yeah, so I've that's been another seeing really big... more and more around that importance as well, mm. especially because it seems that sleep apnea. Um, is on the rise a fair huge, bit, um, men and women, I think predominantly men, but yet yeah, a, a major, mm. major issue, undiagnosed sleep apnea, whether obstructive or, yeah. or other, there seems to be other at, idiopathic manifestations. At a normal weight as well. I see it in a lot of people that are yeah. not overweight and then there's that, there's that, you know, oral airway issue and, oh, uh, look, this is once again, you should probably get um, Scott on to talk to you about this, but he, you know, he talks about the fact that it can come from you know, tongue ties and, and, and oral airway from, you know, either a, a methylation issue in utero, which can come from a nutritional issue, right? So it all comes back down full circle yeah. that we all have genetic um, snips, I guess, or genetic propensities, but it's our environment that's allowing them to, to flourish. And if we don't have the right nutrition for our specific genes, then they you will get further issues downstream. And one of those things he talks about are things like tongue ties and, and stuff, which can actually affect mm. um, oral airway, which can then in increase mouth breathing at night. So it's, it's, it's complicated, but it's also so simple. <laughs> like it's, you know, it's, it's, it's relatively it's, straightforward. Yeah. It, is, yeah. it is if you get in before you've conceived, um, but it's, it's, yeah, yeah. it's just, uh, you know, it's, a, it's another, another big rabbit hole actually, but, but really interesting. Absolutely. And I'm, seeing, I'm seeing him do some beautiful work. So, um that's another really yeah great big one so that's well, that comes maybe uh, i'll like have this. to reach out at some point mm. have a chat with him as well yeah 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 no definitely um and mm, then where great. are we up to so we did sleep nutrition um movement sleep so we've got yeah movement movement's a, a big one for sure it is a big one and I, I kind of um once again you meet people where they're at and i will start with just move walk take the stairs you know get don't have to Calculate your steps. Don't take make it too complicated. Just put in a walk, and actually, that will tick a few of the other pillars that I'll talk about, like getting outside and 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 and, and you know, it's a stress management tool and things like that. Um, my patients will attest to the fact that I'm not a big fan of them going for endless jogs. Um, I just don't think it's an evolutionary normal movement. Um, and and yeah. and people don't necessarily come and see me when they're at their optimal health already. Um, I see people that are. You know, there's a range, but they're either very, very fragile or they are getting the repercussions of our stressful environment. And I'm very big on talking to them about, well, what's your, where are you, your body already is in fight and flight. Um, and if you are in fight and flight and your, your brain perceives you as not safe, it doesn't want to let your weight go. It's not going to prioritize your digestion. It's not going to prioritize healing. You're susceptible to more viruses and colds and things in the environment. If, if you're constantly in that fight and flight and our conscious body and our subconscious or our autonomic nervous system and our conscious actions um, don't talk to each other. They, 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 are, they communicate through signaling and through, through you know, production of certain, I guess, hormones or chemicals or whatever. So if you are running, your, body, your brain doesn't know that you're running for fun. It, you're running from, you know, it will assume you're running for fear. It's not like this for everybody. Um, but there is a, this, this misconception of, okay, you might get an endorphin release because a lot of people are like, well, I feel really good after I've run. I'm like, okay, but how are you sleeping? Yeah. And how are you digesting? digesting? And how are your, how, what's your weight doing? Um, so what are all of these other markers on the side um, going on? Because that run doesn't just affect you that day. It can have a bigger picture. So once again... Back to the kind of absolute foundations, I, I, muscle mass is important. And I don't mean looking like you're a bodybuilder, but just lean mass. That could be bone mass, muscle mass. Um, all of that is, is, is quite important. And that's where the protein and, and you know, doing some form of resistance work, whether that's a, 
a weightlifting session or just you know body weight movements or something where you are using using your body from from a resistance yeah. perspective um and doing that as, as often as you can and that could be 15 minute workouts it doesn't have to be a full one and a half hour gym you just got to make it make it something that's achievable um and yeah. then and then a bit of zone two i think can be helpful you know there's a lot of studies that show that from a cardiovascular perspective zone two is great but teaching a my patients what is zone two you should be able to breathe through your nose the whole time you should be able to hold a whole yeah, conversation a lot of people think think they're in zone two but they're actually zone three or four <laughs> yeah exactly and it's hard because also where's your fitness level if i went for a very light jog i would go way over zone two right now because i'm not um, I, I haven't yeah. been doing that activity so finding something which can keep you in zone two for you know start with you know 10 15 minutes a week or whatever and work your way up to you know 20 or 20 or 40 minute kind of hike or something like that where you your heart rate's going to that 140s um you feel puffed but you could breathe through your nose uh, so once a week that kind of training is great um and if you are sleeping well feeling well doing well then a bit of hit training once or twice a week is is not bad but it takes five minutes it's not meant to be a one hour hit yeah. session um just little little yeah. pulses of it is kind of where i where i sit and that could be at the end of your resistance workout or something like that but 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 not if you're not you know if you've got a, a full-time job three kids you're not sleeping your your boss is doing your head in and you, and you know you don't feel good and you're, you're constantly already pent up I mean, which was a lot of my patients um navigating the world right now are I in, see the in same. such a stress yeah they're so stressed don't go and do a hit workout um do calm You're it's all about the, the allostatic yeah. Load, yeah i often use the allostatic load or the the, the stress mm. bucket right and uh, it's funny because i see a lot of people as well and it's very much especially like the type a kind of high performer type where their whole lifestyle is very stressful and then you know do you ask them if they have any stress reduction practice and they're like oh yeah working out I'm like well it's it's not really stress reduction it makes you feel good yeah. but like physiologically what your nervous system is doing you know you're more sympathetic it's not really that rest or digest state i think that's important for people to realize that there's a difference between actual downtime and recovery and you know working out and feeling like it's helping you and of course there are health benefits like we said between resistance training cardio hit but it's not the same as recovery and downtime and being yeah. that more parasympathetic rest and digest right it's a state of high cortisol high epinephrine you know it's yep. a, it's a stressful state it's not it's not a rest state so people definitely need to balance that out a little bit more and have some actual downtime yeah i mean it's it's almost as if they good efforts are a hindrance are going to set them back like you know it's 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 what they're doing is not bad and it's so hard to tell someone that's exercising a lot that actually this could be harming you or this could be holding you back from your goals that you're wanting to achieve um and i come from a place of experience with with my patients of saying seeing really good things happen when people do just take their foot off the gas pedal a little bit and or, or change you know, and a lot of these people need to be doing something, um, and actually, you know, got to find them something that will still give them a bit of, you know, um, satisfaction, but not actually be um, overloading their stress bucket at that time. Um, it's a fine, fine yeah. balance, but really, really important one. Um, but at least yeah, absolutely. And from well, a, it's, it's good. That's the thing, and I think about this a lot. Is my background is is movement, being a physio. Mm -hmm. um, so I've thought about movement, and I think about movement from an evolutionary perspective as well. And you know, what did we do often? And I think it was lots of walking, lots of incidental movement from foraging, hunting, moving around. We occasionally sprinted. We carried things. We weren't necessarily in a gym because the world around us was our gym. Like we didn't exercise. Yep. Yep. per se we we just yep. we just moved frequently and i think that often goes um undervalued of just that regular movement which mm. it's easier said than done now because so much of our world we we spend sitting at a desk sitting mm. in a car so i think the avoidance of being sedentary is one of the most important things what kind of movement like you said whatever you can just just get out and move as as often as possible and yeah i always i think about that side and I've been a big fan of, you know, things like parkour and stuff, because I think that's really interesting from the mm. evolutionary perspective of, you know, how did we move around and get around the environment? But I think the the main thing is we just try to got to get people moving a little bit more in whatever manner they can. Yeah, definitely. I, and this probably spills over actually, to the next one. You go. Yeah, I think I was going to segue into that as well, because um, one of the things that I find is 
really evolutionary, evolutionarily relevant and also ties into the outdoor nature component is hiking. And you mentioned hiking. And mm, I think that's yeah. such a fantastic activity for people, especially if you're, you're going out in nature and doing a proper hike because you're walking on uneven ground, you know, you're stepping over rocks, you're maybe carrying a pack, you're doing lots of things where it's such a great exercise. Plus you get the benefit of being outside, you're exposed to nature, sunlight, fresh air, all of those yep. things and the yep. nature deficit disorder space is I yes. think, again something that people don't focus <laughs> yeah. on enough yeah and it's something you can do with a friend or a loved one or your family or you know you, you there's so many things that you can layer up together um and you know when i did it in the program i say look i'd like you to be doing this type of exercise at some point but also spending time with loved ones and actually getting out in nature and then actually seeing the sunrise I'm like hey you can do all that together on a Saturday morning and you've ticked your boxes for the things that I'd like you to be consciously bringing into your life and 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 that's you know everyone likes something that's easy and um, that ticks all the boxes so that that is it I mean just listening to you talk about the movement side of things and actually I guess we can bring in stress management which is one of our the foundations that we talk about and I've been back to India numerous times as a child. Um, my grandparents lived there. And so I, we would go back, you know, every year or so. Um, and I, I say this to my patients a lot, that they were, um, where my grandparents lived in India is a vi in the village, right? So very, still, you know, agricultural, but it's very basic, well out of the city, kind of completely untouched. Um, I've, I've watched the, the the actual house itself become a bit more modernized but when we used to go back when we were tiny i mean the toilets were just we were coming from the uk we were like oh gosh you know but <laughs> but when you spend time and we would go for a few weeks at a time so my granddad would have the farm that um they would go and get all their weed and lentils and everything from in the village um across from you was the paddock with the cows where you'd get your milk and all the dairy and everything all, all, all fresh and then in the actual in our actual home we had a few fruit trees and, and whatever that would grow seasonally but ultimately apart from the you know i guess the farmers going out to go and do their work for the day it was the most i don't want a better word for than lazy human the humans that i saw were generally what we would now call lazy they were constantly mm -hmm. just they, they'd be sitting around chatting cooking together the one neighbor would come by another neighbor would come by it was just very um nobody was in a rush nobody needed to get anywhere the housework's being done all the cooking is in the squat position like you know that you know but yeah. the fact that my grandma wasn't doing any targeted exercise she was mobile and 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 healthy and and you know i had i had great grandparents so my my great grandparents my great granddad and um, my great grandma was, I think one of them here was 103. Like, like you know, so like, like I, they, they lived till an old age. And my, my little great grandma was, was right there with it till the end, you know, tiny and frail, yeah. but you know, yeah. she was, she was with and it. That's so, what we used to see. I think that was the norm good. for only two or three generations ago. Yeah. And it, they are constantly grounded, barefoot, outside the whole time, always outside. They are chatting and always with people never alone like you know no one's on their own at home you know there's people around there's chatter but they are what i would the way i describe it is they're constantly in that parasympathetic nervous system that was their dominant state if they needed to go into sympathetic overdrive they could because you know there's an electricity or something's happened or someone's sick or someone's hurt or whatever you could you could pulse that we don't kind of sit like that at the moment we sit in constant sympathetic quickly get everybody up get their breakfast in got to get to school got to do drop off got to get to work it's almost the complete we're, opposite we're, we're complete opposite we're go 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 oh one second i better book a massage i better do a yoga class i better actually make myself now pulse the parasympathetic um so yeah. from a physiological perspective our human bodies are we're, we're flipped we've completely flipped our autonomic nervous system over um and and that to me is a is a massive um massive massive issue so anything that we can do to trick our body into saying that well we're, we're okay we're in parasympathetic you know there, there is no lion we're not going through a famine we're okay you know anything that we can do to, to to help remind our body of that i think is really beneficial and bringing that in as a daily practice you know and i, I mean beyond just sitting and meditating every day because i know for you know that's it's the time the effort all of that I, I think it's a great practice and if you can bring that in fantastic but having some way of of slowing things down a bit and saying okay you know do we really have to 
put our kids into 10 extracurricular activities a week or should we just sit with them and play a board game or you know just just changing things around yeah. a little bit um and that's really try where, where, I, where I try but you know I'm, I'm a victim to this too I mean you know my time at home I've got patient emails I've got you know results to check off I'm constantly you know working yeah. I'm also doing a master's and I've got the kit you know so I get, I get the juggle is real. I do get it. Um, and I've got a lot of learning to do myself in this field. But that's where I do say, so that's, I guess, if we're talking about stress management, I kind of come at it from that perspective of trying to educate people into learning how the nervous system is is wired and, and, and how our actions in daily life will have an impact on our, our physiology and why it might be that actually an argument with your boss tips you over the edge um because actually you were already your like you said your bucket analogy that's a great one i use that a lot your bucket's already already full and now you're just overflowing um and we need to empty yeah. that bucket um and that's really where yeah where a lot of the stress side of things comes in yeah yeah it's un unfortunately sort of a, a product of modern society where we're just all of us if you live in a city at least in a metropolitan and you have a job then your stress is probably significantly higher than say our ancestors were not that long ago and and yeah. I think they've even done research to look at even modern day um, hunter gatherers, but definitely in the past, yeah, the amount of downtime they had was significant. And then there's the community side, which I think you kind of pointed at as well, of just the connection, community, not being isolated is a huge mm. part. And nowadays the world seems to segregate more and more and become sort of more locked in our own little cupboards, especially now with social media, as we were saying, and you know, we don't have the extended family living together. We don't have a, a larger community. And I think all of that plays into that aspect as well, of even just feeling comfortable, feeling safe, and then just having that time of just sitting. Yeah, definitely. And that's, that's another one of the foundations I've talked about is human, is human connection um, and, and reaching out to, to people. I mean, look, my husband and I are both from the UK. So all of his family's there, all of my family's there. Um, and, and, and that's not normal. We're, we're not meant to be living that segregated. Um, we, we are meant to, so, you know, we, you have to create your family here. I've just been on a beautiful five day, um, camping trip with three other families, um, who have all got similar things, whose parents aren't around or, or whatever, and they've got small children and we just come together, um, as much as we can to have a bit of that community. It's so important. So, so important. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think at yeah. the end of the day, we are social animals. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Even if we believe that or not, yeah. because the stress can actually make you want to isolate. And that's one of the first signs, right? That, that we, even as, as a, as a GP that you see when you're looking for clinical depression or, or anyone that's really low is they don't want to be around other people. They are withdrawing themselves. They're not in the mood to go to places. They don't find that things are as enjoyable as they used to be. Um, and, and that's a big warning sign, really big warning sign, because that's not normal for a human being to feel that way. Um, great. Look, a bit of solitude think, is, is not bad, but, but yeah, not at the expense of your mental health. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think even the research shows in relation to all cause mortality, like social isolation mm. is more yeah. significant than smoking, drinking, all those types of things. So it is such a important part of it to make sure that yeah, you're getting at least some in there. And if you feel disinclined to it, then yeah, maybe it's a deeper investigation as to why you might feel that way. Yeah, no, definitely. So that's, I think we've kind of covered most of the, the things. And then I, I do talk a little bit about um, detox redox. And I kind of put that in the sense of these are like, I, from an absolute basic is looking at environmental toxins and looking at environmental, um, you know, exposures and being mindful of the fact that um, they're not all great for your health. Um, they may not make you feel horrendous the second that you, you know, have worn a perfume or something, but actually... The, the, the load is real. Um, so they could be things like um, the cleaning products in your home, your cosmetics, your plastics that you eat out of. Um, you know, we've uh, I've had this chat with my husband about things and he's like, oh, you're still going to put petrol in your car and you still go. I was like, yeah, exactly. So you can't, you can't hide from it all, right? So yeah. you do have, there is that um, element of it. But, but the load is high right now. Like we've got, if you look at our environment, it's, it's, there's, it's, you go insane if you try to completely clean your whole life up. Well, and, it's and I, impossible. It, it is impossible. And I think you need to know that it's impossible, but actually it doesn't mean you can't do little bits. 
um, and, and just yeah. do do your best, but don't go crazy. So it's not exactly affordable for everyone to eat organic. But if you were trying to be mindful, then there's a clean 15 and the dirty dozen. It's great. You've got the evidence out there that actually these have got the least number of pesticides in versus those. So you can make a better choice. Don't need to spend five dollars yeah, on a which I'll, I'll link those uh, for people because yeah, yeah, maybe great. not everyone's familiar with the environmental mm. working group, but I'll I'll link that there. They they've done a lot of sort of private research and in looking into yeah, pesticides, toxins, etc. So I'll definitely share that for people. Yeah, yeah, no, it's fantastic. So that's that's a nice easy way of of just making sure that your environment is as clean as it can be. And and I've made a big shift um, towards that. And then. Look and other side of things which we don't need to get into, but EMFs and things like that. So you know, constantly being wired to everything and trying to, to you know, everything's wireless these days. So can we minimise that? Like you know, just switch your Wi-Fi off at night or, or or something. You don't have to fully hardwire your house unless you wanted to and walk around with cords everywhere. But but just kind of find a little balance, right? Like it's just it's just just getting that balance. And then and then have a tech break. Go camping. Get off grid. Switch your phone off. Get away from it all and just actually have a little yeah, your body a break. Digital detox. That's it. It's amazing. It feels so good. Um, you know, just just have an absolute say. No, that's it. We're having a, a week off and we're going to just withdraw for a bit um, and and reset. And it's it's a really good feeling. I feel you know come off mine today, and it's it's great. Um, so yeah, doing things like that is a nice and, feeling. And navigating it, it is, yeah. And and just finding that that balance and being mindful of the fact that if you once again, all of this is for people that are either just trying to optimize how they feel, or or if they're trying to reach a health goal, um, you know. And if if you feel like okay, I'm not still quite feeling as good as I could be, or or you know. Uh, I still have some goals that I want to achieve, then actually looking a bit deeper into these certain aspects can be helpful. Um, and then I put the word detox there, but I also talk about the word redox. Once again, the functional world, there is a lot of aggressive detox going on and I'm not a big fan. I, think, I would agree. I think our body is naturally so wonderful at dealing with things given the right environment. So if you are sleeping well, if you are eating well, if you are moving, if you are using your environment and your body is functioning like it's supposed to, your digestive system's working, you know, you've looked maybe at certain genetics if you needed to and you've got the right nutrients there for that, then you can detox. Your body you, you, your body has the ability to deal with, with your environment and, and giving your body the right environment to do that in is important rather than forcing it too hard and look there's caveats to everything and there's certain situations where you might want to do a bit more of a protocol or, or, or whatever with, with but i'm not talking about people with specific illnesses i'm talking in general the average human that wants to just feel better and be healthy um shouldn't really need to go through any massive aggressive detoxes they should your body's pretty clever um but yeah, yeah I but agree. there are I have the same approach yeah. And there's obviously time to place, whether it's chelation therapy or something for mm. heavy metals, or maybe there's mold. But I think for the vast majority of people, they don't need to do these extravagant cleanses and things. You just need to support the environment in your body sufficiently through nutrition, lifestyle, et cetera. And it usually, as you said, it does a pretty good job of healing itself. Mm. Yeah. yeah. No, the mm. human body is fascinating and um, never ceases to sure is. me. It is. It's great. Yeah, same. And it's, same. So I yeah, love biology. So, <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's It's great to see. And it's you know, you're just trying to give your your body, which is the best tool you've got, the the right way to to deal with it all. And it's yeah, the results have been, I, I yeah, look, I've, I absolutely love what I do. I've got a new passion for it. I feel like I've got to a place now where I'm finally doing the things that I did med school. You know what I mean? Like I like I just see the results. I've got beautiful yeah. relationships with my patients. Like it's just you know, and 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 um, talk about that human connection I mean I get to chat to, to, to my patients for an hour at a time and really get to know them and, and I love it I, lo I really really do love it um, and helping them it's amazing. Really get better yeah and and look they, they're the ones doing it's the hard fantastic. work they are the ones yep. that are getting themselves better and that's there's no better tool than that the amount that I've had that are like oh I wasn't you know had Christmas or whatever but I just got back on and I did this and I feel better again it's like well you did it all yourself you know it's you great it's really good. Yep. Yeah. So I, I think that's a, the big shift that medicine needs to take is towards empowerment and less towards, I guess, hierarchical dictator like presentation and time and a place. Of course, if you're going to see a surgeon or something, then sure. But for the vast majority of primary care, I think there's a lot of power in empowering people and educating them on how to help themselves and, and not being reliant, say, on a practitioner or, or the system. 
Definitely, definitely. It would just require um, a lot more support for, for, and I think a lot of practitioners out there want to do that. I mean, I, coming from a GP world, um, it's all about family medicine and helping them and knowing them. And, 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 and you know, it always was. It's just the 10 minute side of things is, is really hindering that ability for a GP to get that relationship with the patient to empower them. It comes from trust. Yeah. Um, and it comes from, you know, when I first started this, the pe- patients of mine that were doing it were the ones that had known me for a while. Um, and, and that comes with, you know, the time and, and being able to sit with them. And unfortunately, a lot of GPs are pushed quite hard um, with, 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 you know, appointment times and things. It's, 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 it's a really tricky, a tricky, tricky um, situation um, in terms of yeah. getting it out there in, the prim- in primary care. But it's, you know, there's definitely a more awareness of it. Um, and there's ways for people to start doing simple things themselves. I mean, I'm not asking them to do anything dangerous, you know, seeing the sun in the morning and, and eating a good, good food. It's not, a, none of that's going to actually, you know, it's all, all pretty easy things that they can start to do. Um, I guess the only caveat to any yeah. of this would be if people are on, you know, not to obviously take some medical advice, but if they're on, you know, I'm talking about people that aren't coming with any chronic diagnoses or, or on a whole array of medications or whatever, you do really need to work closely with somebody if that's, if that's where you're at in, in your current medical journey. But for the average person that just wants to of feel course. a bit better, this is all pretty good. Actually, when we did our yeah. first yeah, couple fantastic. of programs, I kind of felt like, oh, I wish every patient that saw me had gone through this six week course. Um, number one, I wouldn't need to see half of them. And number two, it would just, they come already with the foundations embedded in because it was, it was just so good to be able to spend, you know, that time with them weekly. Um, to actually watch them through the change, coach them through the through it, brainstorm any questions they've got or issues that they've had through it, and and actually you know give them meal ideas or or give them ways to tweak their lifestyle and actually support them through the change. Because the first couple of weeks are tough, depending on where you're coming from. Absolutely. Um, and and just to be able to provide proper education was great. So even with my long consults, I sometimes you know I, it's really hard to fit it all in an hour. So this was good. Um, it was a good way of doing it. So it was we really 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 yeah. enjoyed it actually. Yeah, we've done a few now. Been, yeah, I would agree. Great. I think having having a program like that would would be helpful. I think for everyone, especially in today's world where we do have somewhat of a chronic disease epidemic. So I would highly recommend people jump through that program. And, and again, I think from that ancestral perspective, if we view things from that light and we cover aspects of lifestyle of all the things we've gone through, then it's relatively straightforward. It's not easy necessarily to implement, but I think if you put the time in and, and work with someone to get there, then yeah, the results can be quite, quite phenomenal. Yeah, that's good. Hard to unsee now. Amazing. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll definitely share a bit more about your program and I'll put everything in the show notes, but if people want to find out more about you, your program, perhaps work with you, where can people find you and uh, contact you? Um, so I've got my website, um, which is drrevigornall.com.au. And then I am on Instagram under Dr. Ravi Gornall. Um, they're pretty much the, the, the best avenues. Yeah. Instagram's yep, a, a new experience for us, but uh, I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'm not yep. quite a. It's always always there, a bit of a challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you kind of you know it's 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 it, it's a good platform. I mean, I, I you know I'm on it looking at other people's stuff, so why not put some stuff up yourself? Yep. But yep. it's it's a if you use the tool appropriately, then it can be good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. But yeah, that's the best. Great. Point. Well, thank you so much for. For your time and sharing all your knowledge and, and covering all those topics we covered quite a bit and it's really just the the tip of the iceberg so thank you so much for your time and i look forward to chatting with you again thank you for having me thanks for listening to today's episode if you enjoyed the content be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes and if you're looking to add in nature's most nutrient-dense foods back into your diet be sure to check out vitalorigin.com.au and use coupon source 10 at checkout for an extra 10 percent off we'll see you guys on the next episode